Okay. Um, well, I'm going to finish the, this set of classes with a, an application of the uh, of the models that I described in the first lecture. That means the low-dimensional dynamics for describing the periphery of the of the vocal organ, but with an application that is to to listen to the dreams of these uh, animals I've been um, studying in the last years. So we're going to be talking about the physics of birds on production, but concentrating on how to use them to listen to a bird's dream, and how to induce dreams as well. Um, <clears throat> again, the question is very easy. Uh, what I would like to do is something that we all would like to do, I guess. What I would like to do is to have some device, preferably an application in my cell phone, um, transmit what I'm dreaming, I have a password in my application so no one else can, can look at it, but then go and look at the picture of what I was dreaming, right? This is something that I would find very, very useful. And, and, and of course we know that that we cannot do because we don't know the code of the brain. So we, we don't know. We don't know how it works. We see a pattern of activity, and we, we cannot reproduce so far uh, what we're thinking about. Everyone that is doing theoretical neuroscience is trying to unveil in some particular regime the coding of the, of the brain. But what we can do is something that, um, that is done in, in biology a lot, that is to borrow a concept of neuroethology that is the concept of uh, champion species. So neuroethology is the branch of uh, biology that studies the neural basis of behavior. And neuroethology eventually studies neural coding, but always in the framework of a behavior. But and one characteristic that they have in this community is that uh, they have this concept of a champion species. So in order to study a particular problem, you have to study in one species where this is easy to, to be studied. So as I was telling you before, ocine brains, birds, like for example canary or zebra finches, constitute an animal model to understand how a complex behavior, this vocalization, is learned. And, um, and of course, there is this additional advantage that is they do it with a particular set of nuclei each nuclei being a few hundred thousand neurons, more or less, interconnected, so that you know that that part of the brain is preferably you know, dedicated to the learning of that behavior. Um, and concerning our problem, due to, ne to the need of unveiling the role of sleep during learning, there is a substantial amount of work on which is the neural activity in different parts of the song system when the bird is sleeping. So there are reports of animals which uh, who are learning, and eventually, if you disrupt them, they, they will learn words and so on. So there is a lot of reports that in the problem of the learning, there is some consolidation that takes place at night, and therefore, um, there is a lot of uh, neural and behavioral you know, uh, research on what happens in the brain of a learning animal when, when the bird is sleeping. So this is a typical recording of what you would have when the bird is awake and eventually singing a song. So here I'm displaying a sonogram, so the, the, the evolution in time of the spectral content of the song. And when the bird is singing, there is some pattern of activity. And it was reported in 2000, more or less, that when the bird is sleeping, from time to time you have these bursts of activity that highly correlate with the activity that you have when the bird is actually singing. So here what I'm having, I'm displaying is a bird that is singing, and the neural activity of the singing bird, and you know, there is a high correlation between what the bird is uh, doing at night, particularly during REM periods, periods where you know that resemble the REM in humans, and you have this burst of activity. These in particular recordings in this region here, that is the robustus nucleus of the archistratum, is part of the telencephalon. This is the one that I was showing you before, the measurements from HVC is what I was showing you before. In this case, this is RA. Um, so the idea is that uh, if there is a specific pattern associated with the production, like this, 
during the sleep, eventually, you see the same pattern of activity. The similitude led to the concept of consolidation. So there were some papers in, 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 in science about this in the year 2000, and the interpretation of the New York Times and the media typically were, well, you know, this is the idea of consolidation. You need to rest well in order to learn something because you practice it over and over, and that reinforces the connectivity that you need in order to produce the behavior. So the concept of consolidation grew 20 years ago due to these uh, papers from my friend Dan Margolias of the University of Chicago. So that was a work that had a lot of impact recently. So the problem is that what wasn't reported in that work is that besides those events where there is activity that is very similar to the activity that was performed during the action, there are other patterns. So if you want to know what the bird is dreaming, you won't have only that the bird is dreaming with the song that is eventually practicing, because the regions that are dedicated to the song eventually have some episodic events which you cannot interpret because are not highly correlated with uh, the ones that it does during the day. So the problem is still how to interpret the difference of what was presented present during the song. So we have the same problem at the beginning. We don't have the code, and therefore you cannot interpret what is not identical to what the bird was doing. So just as in the presentation of the problem, in this system we don't know the neural, neural code in the song system. So we, if we see something that is not exactly what the bird was doing when it was producing the song, you cannot interpret it. But let me remind you something that we have in the first lecture. What we do have is how to, a way, a model that allows you to interpret the electrical activity in the muscles that we have, we have a model that if you give me the activity in the respiratory muscles and in the syringeal muscles, you know that you have a model where you can plug those instructions, you are going to have some paths in parameter space, and they're going to be generating song. Let me remind you of what these kind of songs would sound like. Okay? Oops. Okay? So this is what these normal forms were generating a sound when you would have this parameter, you know, pass in this passing parameter space driving the normal form. And as you know, in order to validate this model, for a long time we're measuring these uh, two parameters, you know, the, the air sac pressure and the syringeal muscle. So we had measurements. And at one point, we looked at this system and we realized that there was something strange that is the following. Um, HVC connects to RA. RA connects to respiratory nuclei, okay? And we know that there is an inhibition that allows you to interrupt the activity in the telencephalon, so you can be dreaming whatever, but when you are sleeping, you are not producing sounds, okay? So there is some inhibition of the activity from the telencephalon to the periphery. But N12, that is the nuclei where you have the neurons that project to the syringeal muscles, don't have any inhibitory population. I was building these models and I noticed that. And I said, well, well if, if there is nothing there, who is stopping the activity in the syringeal muscles? No? And then one day I said, but I was thinking about that so hard for a long time. I said, well, maybe. It's not stopped. Maybe it's there. Maybe if you go and I take measurements from 10 years ago, you have hundreds of measurements, hundreds of days of measurements. When I plug these electrodes, the bird is singing and I measure it during the day. And during the night, it's sleeping. And I never paid attention to what happens when, when, it, when the bird is sleeping. So maybe there is something there. Maybe if there is no population inhibiting those activities, these activities go to the ceilings and there is activity in the masses. Let me remind you what our typical experiment would look like. This is the song, this is the air sac pressure, and this is the activity of uh, some dorsal muscle, and this is the activity of a syringeal muscle. And this here is what happens during the sleep. 
So during the sleep, of course, the respiratory activity is just the normal respiration of a bird that is not producing any sound. The bird is sleeping, is completely silent, there is no air going through the lumen of this labia, so there is no sound whatsoever. But from time to time, we found these events where you have patterns of activity in the muscle, like little shakes in the syringeal muscles, okay? And if you look at them, they look very, but very similar to the patterns during the day. For example, I don't know, here we have the, let's see, the, the, the green here would have these spikes, this huge spike in here, and you recognize it in here, or the blue one that has all these five sort of spikes and these five sort of spikes and so on. So during the night, the bird is completely silent, but at the seedings, you have patterns of activity. How similar are those patterns of activity from the patterns that are used during the production of the song? So what we did is we looked at um, the activity during the day. So you would have these pressure patterns and these muscle activity patterns. And we separated what we call templates. And then I would take these hundreds of hours of measurements of electrical activity during the night and computed the correlation with those patterns. And of course, most of the time there is nothing, there is no correlation at all, but from time to time you get these huge spikes of correlation between some color, okay, and the time trace that you record during the night. If you look at then the data of the night, you have an EMG that is silent activity, and suddenly when you have, for example, this peak of activity, what you have is that the syringeal muscle is having this shake that is very similar to the shake that is produced in order to generate the song. Or in here that you have this blue one, and you have this peak that is blue, and you have that this pattern is very similar to this little piece of the template. And of course there are other things that are difficult to interpret. When do they happen at night? Well, that's very interesting. There are these peaks of activity, more or less each hour. Each hour the bird dreams. It has, during the, the, those periods of time, you have this nuclear of activity having these episodes where you have song-like patterns in the muscles. In the first hour, this is very systematic. In the first hour, you have a lot of activity. And then more or less each hour, you have activity. Then there's some time in the middle of the night when the bird doesn't have much activity. And then before waking up, there's another peak. With different colors, I'm displaying the instances where you have correlation with the different templates, okay? So whenever you have a blue line here is that you have correlation with that particular thing. So for example, you have in this hour that you practice a lot this pattern, and in this hour, okay, you practice a lot this pattern in here. Because as you can see, the bird is not producing the whole song all the time, each time that it's dreaming. Let me tell you something interesting about this birds. These birds are born, they practice, and then they finally do their song. After a few weeks of practice, they have their song. And they will sing it during all their lives, all day long. They wake up, they sing, they practice all morning, they rest a little bit, they practice all afternoon, and they do that, this one song, all their lives, all together for the rest of their lives. And that's what happens during the day. During the night, it doesn't do that. It does something more wild. It practices a little bit this syllable. Maybe it practices this, the, the, the whole song. Maybe it practices a syllable and then something else, and so on. Yes? The what? Oh, OK. That's a great question. So it would be wonderful to look at that because you're learning. And the evolution of these gestures is very interesting. The problem with young birds is that the kind of electrodes that we put are in the limit of what you can put to an animal in such a way that is comfortable and is not distressful. So when you have a young bird, our technology would be too invasive in order to do that. 
So we have the problem that, you know, because the birds are very young, are very small, very tiny, and if you put their electrodes, it's very aggressive. Uh, Okay, but then you're talking about a different thing. You're talking about looking at the brain activity. In here, what, one, what I'm talking about is the muscle activity, which is the one that I could traduce with the model into a song. Because you can look at the activity, the brain activity of, of a young bird, and that we have, but then you cannot interpret it, right? So you can interpret it when you have something that you recognize because it's associated to what it's doing during the day. And when he's doing something else, you don't know what to do. Yeah. But if you want, to, if you could do that. So I was, uh, not long ago, I was giving a talk, and a young guy asked me, why don't I try with a different species like canary? He was a biologist. Uh, canaries learn more than one song. So each year, when they change feathers, there is neurogenesis, new neurons emerge, get connected, and then they learn new songs. And in that experiments you could do in an adult that is learning this follow-up that you're suggesting. But since uh, this guy asked me that question, I never had a chance to run the experiments again, but I'm going to steal him that question because it goes in the same direction as yours. That is what happens during the learning. And uh, in that case, you could follow it in an adult. In this species, it learns only when they are very young, and I cannot do the experiment. Exactly. That's right. That's right. It, you're correct. So you, I'm going to show you a table in a few minutes. So what Mauro is saying is in here, so what he says is that this line in here is showing you the song-like activity that is really correlated with some specific pattern. But I was saying that there is garbage here which is not included. So what he's asking is this pattern-like activity, which percentage of the total activity it would be, right? Did, did I interpret right? Yeah. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. This is a very good question. Because consolidation suggests that this should cover most of what is practiced, right? So let me show you a histogram of what we can recognize. So what, what the bird does is practices some sea levels a lot, very simple sea levels, they practice them a lot. And from time to time, they practice combinations, two combinations, two sea levels, three sea levels, and only a small percentage of time it practices the whole song, or almost the whole song. And I'm not listing here what you are asking, which is which, which percentage of this is, is, uh, is song-like and, and how much is something else. I'll keep you uh, intrigued for a while, for a little bit. So if I want to do the experiments of listening to the song, my, my strategy would be then take these uh, measurements, feed them into the model of the seedings, and synthesize the song. Okay? So I would take this, feed it in here, solve the nonlinear equations, maybe the normal forms for this, and synthesize song and, and, and listen to it. The only problem is that we still don't know how to go from actually the EMG activity and the tension of a labium. There is a little bit of mechanics that you have to do there because what you have is that the muscle activity is the muscle activity of, okay, is the activity of a muscle that what we'll do is to stretch this, uh, to separate these two annuli here, and when you separate those, there is going to be a labium that is going to be stretched. So you have to do a model first for, given the activity of the muscle, how it changes the length of the muscle. Going to, from the, 
length of the muscle to see how it changes the force that the, mus the, that the muscle is doing. And then using the force to the labium to see how it stretched. You have to do all that. You have to do the homework, right? So, so we have to do, in order to listen to these things, not only the measurements and the integration of the model, but also do a model for the muscle and the labium. So we do it. So when you have activity in a muscle, the basic idea is that the rest position of the, of the muscle gets shorter, OK? And this is what we're modeling here. OK, so the different parts of the model are described in here. And finally, this allows you to compute, which is the average tension during the production of the song. So in here, what we have is a song. And in here, what you have is the prediction of what frequency you would expect, which fundamental frequency you would expect in labia, which are oscillating when you have certain level of activity. And you fit it very well. So it's a very simple model, because there are two linear models, right? The two models that I'm using are linear. The only nonlinearity is this term that allows you to go from the length of a muscle to the force that you exert. But the first is a linear model, and the second one is a linear model. This is the linear model for the muscle. This is a linear model for the labium. And this is the force that the muscle is doing on the labium. It's the only nonlinear term. But when you do that, you can take an EMG and transduce it into frequency. OK? This is what I was showing you before. So this is an example. This is another example. This is work done by Juan Doppler in Buenos Aires, a grad student in my lab. So he took a little segment here, let's say one syllable. I don't, let's see if I remember which one. Let's say that this is the first one. I don't remember in this example which one. But he would take a little segment in here and fit the parameters of these two, -linear, two linear oscillators. And then he would get the EMG for the complete song, and he would get all these fundamental frequencies. The only points where it misses are these points. You have to multiply by two by, to get the right frequency. But that is because that syllable is done by closing one side, and the whole flow goes on the in only one side, and the frequency is multiplied by two. So even that aspect is well captured by the model. It's very elegant. It's very, very elegant. So we can reproduce the features of the song just by looking at the EMGs in the masses. OK. Why don't we listen to some songs? So what I'm going to show you here is a song. And here, we're going to do that. We're going to take the electrical activity in the muscle, play it in these models, and listen to what the bird is dreaming. So let's see if we can listen to this. This is the song of a bird in the lab. Again. And then what we did is we took a record of the night, the whole night and send it to a small integrator in Python and sat in there to see whether it would start to make noises or not. So it's silent almost all the time. But from time to time, you get this. And that, to tell you the truth, when I heard that, I started to laugh. I couldn't start laughing for like half an hour. Because really, it was the first time that I could traduce into sound but the bird was sleeping. Okay, so, so the bird was completely asleep. We had the electrical activity, but we knew what it would sound like. Huh? Time, right? Well, the first time we didn't do it in real time, but now we have it in real time. We have the, we have the, and, and we have feedback of what happens when the bird is listening to its own dream. So that's a lot of fun. Now we have it online, but at that time it was from records that we had before. Interesting thing is that this thing is a song that it will never be produced, never be produced by an awake bird. So the combination is completely original. It's just some segments which are, um, which are pasted together. So now, Mauro, this is for you. The average occurrence of each song-like activity type will standard error. So one syllable, 20% of the time. Syllable plus unknown, 12% of the time. Two syllables or more, 
15% of the time, two or more plus unknown, 5% of the time. Complete motifs, only 6% of the time. So much uh, is the whole song, which supposedly is what you should be doing in a consolidation paradigm, right? You practice at night what you will be doing the, the, during the day. And the same level are, are all the same in probability, or just it depends on the bird? So, how, how so, so we, we didn't have time to do it. Okay, so it's, so it's a very good question, and we don't know. Uh, so we did. Uh, okay, so we did many experiments with this, but we never compared massively. Okay the dreams of many individuals. Uh, the report, the informal report that I could give to you is that they, in general what they do is they practice these very simple syllables much more than the rest and that the motif is only produced a small percentage of the time. <coughs> but a systematic study of all the different things, we didn't do it because since all the syllables are different for each animal, it will be difficult to map and do a, a single histogram of that. But, uh, but the idea that the very simple things alone are practiced more is general, and that the complete motifs are just a small percentage is, is, is as well. Partial syllables, okay, a lot, 33% of the time, and things which are deformed in time, 10% of the time. Stretching. Stretching or, you know, so syllables with a different timing. So there's no isolated unknown syllables, is that correct? No isolated? No isolated unknown syllables. It always comes together. It always comes come together with something. That's right, that's right. Never something completely weird uh, out of the blue. Yeah. Yeah. It's always like something precise and then very degraded. It's for you to say my perception of dreams. Absolutely. 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 It's absolutely like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly like that. Yeah. 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 Another interesting thing, which I don't know if I, I, I don't think I have the slide in here, is that they can dream different things with the two sides of the seatings. They can dream a, bird, a song in one side and a different song with the other side, or skip syllables. That's Another interesting thing which I don't know how to make out of. But when we did that, we started to think about inducing dreams. Because if you remember from the first uh, talk that I gave, one of the things we used to do is to play a bird its own song. And when you play the bird its own song, it has some response. And if you play the song of conspecific, you don't have it. So now what I want to see is that activity that I measured in the brain, but measured it in the, in the muscle. So here what I'm doing is the following. This is work that we did with Alan Bush in Buenos Aires. Um, we have the bird, and the bird is sleeping. And now we play the bird its own song. And we play it like 20 times, and we're measuring the activity in the seedings. And Exactly as we you know, have been conjecturing, you have this activity that goes down to the seedings, and you have a huge response. Okay? And this response is very similar to the actual pattern of activation that the bird uses when it's producing the song. So what happens if you play the song in reverse? I told you that when you, you, know, when you play the song in reverse, you have no pattern of activity, and basically you see you see that repeated in, in there. If you play the song of a specific bird, you induce nothing at all. And then, in the spirit of doing advertising for nonlinear dynamics, you play the bird, the song generated by a normal form, where what you do is you play the you drive the normal form with the uh, signal that you measure when the bird is singing, and you have a pattern that is very similar to, to this. As you see, there are syllables that are better modeled than others. Okay? There are things that you capture in the birds and song that you don't capture in here, and so on. And one thing that I'm very interested in is which are the features that we're modeling the better 
which are the parameters in the model that are more important. But more interesting of all, in some cases, we induce better signals with the synthetic sound than with the real sound. And I want to create the super exciting song, the most exciting song, and see which are the acoustic features that you need to do that. We're doing this with males with their own song, but also we're doing this with females. We're trying to find what is really sexy for a girl. And we want to find the most sexy song and which are the acoustic features that the synthetic model should have in order to have the female go wild for the, for the male. We want to find which is the acoustic essence of sexiness in birds for whatever is useful, right? But, but it's interesting. You can do that by monitoring this kind of activity. Um, here comes um, one problem which I think is interesting and that we discussed a little bit yesterday during the, 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 your, your presentation. Is there a hierarchy of importance when you do modeling in biology? And I think that for someone who, for those of you that will be working together with biologists, I think it's a key question. <clears throat> Here we have an example. No? The, in, in the, in the, a physicist will always try to look for minimal descriptions of nature, basic laws, universal mechanisms, and that is all inspired in Newton. And this is our Bible, right, the Principia. Biologists have another Bible, which is Darwin's The Origin of Species, that says that all that we see is a unique experiment that grew more and more complex. And when you are talking with the biologists and you talk about the reduction of the complexity, there is always sour feelings, right? Because they will say, oh yeah, yeah. But then you take something out of the picture and let's see if this animal survives at all. Or even if it's alive, right? So it's not a small discussion whether you can simplify or not a biological problem and look for minimal mechanisms. It's a tension that is very exciting, but you have to live with that. And one of the concrete examples that you can do beyond discussing it is doing experiments to see if this, there is a hierarchy of importance when you do the modeling. So one thing that we do a lot is do these modelings and change the parameters and see when the responses don't change or when the responses change a lot. And of course, not every parameter is just as important. Okay? There are things that are more important and there is a hierarchy of importance. So these kind of works that we're showing here go in this direction. For example, you have no response if you've put no noise in the, in the instructions, but when you start to increase the noise, um, you get maximum, and then if you increase it a lot, then you degrade, and the same with every parameter. So one thing that we're very interested in is uh, computing the, um, the, the hierarchy of importance in, in this. Uh, but this experiment is also designed to test something else, that is where you can have atoms in your dreams. That means which is the minimum amount of activity that you can induce acoustically. So you take out something and you see whether you see a pattern of activity or not. And if you take something larger and you see what you eliminate, and when you take something larger, whether you eliminate it completely, and basically what, what we are doing here is a series of experiments where we're playing the song without the segment, without the segment, without the segment, and trying to see what disappears in the response. And, and it doesn't, you know, doesn't go to the point now, but there are, there are minimal elements that are like the atoms of the dreams, uh, and you cannot induce something smaller than that, and, um, and it's a, an interesting story as, as well. Uh, let me jump a little bit. because I want to show you something else that we're very excited about. Eh? Oops. And this is. <laughs> this is something I'm very, I'm, I'm very interested about now. And is the following. This is a bird, which is the Kiskali, the Ventivio. I don't know how you call it in Brazil. Ventivio. Ventivio. OK. Um, and the reason for which I'm interested in this bird is that this, first of all, 
is a sabocin. It means nothing to you, but to me it means a lot because the sabocins are very close to assigned birds, but they don't learn. They are missing something, very small, because evolutionary they are very similar, but they don't learn. So we're interested in knowing what's missing in that brain so they don't learn. That is the first reason. The, the second reason is the only sabocin that you can keep in the lab. You take a Joe de Barro, for example, no? The, uh, Joe de Barro. You, you try to put it in a cage, and after 104 hours, it will die. If you feed it properly, really well, with everything, you, it can last 107 hours. And if it's very weak, it will last 100 hours. But typically, the most you can keep that bird in captivity so far, after talking with the most renowned experts in the best zoos and whatever, is 100 hours, 104 hours. And with many sabocines, that happens. That, that means that you have two options. Develop all your technology to go to the field, which eventually I'm doing, but it's expensive and it's a lot of work, or find a species that you can take to the lab and work in the lab. So we got permit to work with these guys, and they're very tough. You take them to the lab, you do the surgery, you record the, the dreams, you take out the wires, you put them back in the wild, and they're great. So they're very strong, very cooperative birds, and, uh, and you, you, you can do this experiment. But the most in interesting thing to me is whether they dream, and whether they dream weird things or stereotyped things, because this bird will only go bicho feo, bicho feo, no? Bicho feo, bicho feo. That's the only thing they do, basically. But only one thing more, but you know, basically they do this. So at night, you have these patterns of activity. It's very interesting. In the physics of, of birds and production, this is also an, a very interesting thing. The only contribution of this activity is to create this roughness in the first syllable. OK, this is anecdotic. This is another talk, if you want. But this is the activity during the day. And the story of what happens during the night is also an interesting story, and one day Juan Doppler will tell you about it. Basically, there is no stereotypy. They, they also make variations at night, but this is another, another thing. But what I wanted to tell you is this. The only other thing that these guys do is when they get very upset, they make a different sound. They put their feathers up, and they do a trill, OK? that is very distinctive. So when they're upset, they don't sing, okay? They, 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 they put their feathers up and they do a trill. So measuring what they do at night, we found the activity in the muscle that corresponds to the trill. So instead of uh, the activity that I showed you before, with the same frequency of the trill, you get this thing. So this activity is only used when they found another male and they are competing, okay? So these guys are very territorial. They find another male. They put their feathers up, and they do this trill. At night, it practices the trill. But what I found absolutely delightful is to see what was happening in the lab when the bird was practicing that. So we're looking at a bird that is dreaming. And there it is. <laughs> so, the, so the bird is dreaming, okay, then, then it wakes up. Probably it was a very bad dream, but you know, <laughs> when it had this activity, it also had this uh, very aggressive uh, display of behavior. So that's the reason I say that we are recording a real nightmare. Okay, a very aggressive nightmare. It's great. I love it a lot. Well, thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure. Now I expect questions. Well, whenever I hear Trevor's story, I'm absolutely, absolutely amazed and stuck out. And I'm almost just wondering, uh, since the first reason to study um, birds in the first place is that it is a nice animal model for learning in general, I'm wondering to, to which extent Humans do vocalize when they're asleep. We 
So the answer is yes. Uh, so you, I have an idea of how you would go about doing something like this in humans. Uh, I have the impression that, in, that there are some muscle movements and EMGs that you can get in part of your vocal organ that are signatures of that. So it's, it's, a, it's a branch of experience I wouldn't go into myself, but I think that this could be done in, in some aspects in humans and in other species for sure. For sure. Uh, the problem is that to get to the degree where you have, for example, a model that would allow you to translate that to behavior and so on, this is 20 years of experience. So I, I'm showing th that in, in, in four classes, but you know, in order to go to a level where some particular muscle can be associated to some particular thing, it's a lot of work. So if you would start to work with another species, it's a lot of work. But there are infinite opportunities. In, Right. Well, Phil Holmes, who f for all of you in nonlinear dynamics was like a big guru in the 90s and until three years ago he was the chairman of the applied mathematics program in Princeton. He collaborated with some people in Princeton uh, working with monkeys and they used my model of vocal production in birds to reproduce the, the vocalizations in monkeys with the idea that it's the normal form of labia that are coming together. And they're using that to... to to do vocalizations in monkeys. I don't know whether they will go into the whole dream project and so on, but they, they are importing this model from bird song to, to monkeys. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, well, great, the Dr. Siddharth and go freak on the Natal, yeah, I agree, yeah. So Phil Holmes brought in eLife paper two years ago with the, I don't remember the name of the biologist, Gafan, I don't know, I don't remember the name of the guy, uh, that this model would allow him to get vocalizations for baboons, and um, it was very, marmosets, marmosets, it was mar marmosets, yeah, the small one. And, um, and basically they use the same mechanism for, for voice production. Working with, in any case, working with, with monkeys, I don't know, in Brazil, in Argentina would be very difficult. Just to convince people to give us the permits to do this, it requires a lot of, uh, if you go into animal research, one big part of your life is designing protocols that allow you to guarantee that the animal is not suffering, that you have veterinaries, that you have you know, all sort of safeguards, and it's okay that it exists. So, so that, uh, that you know that it's going to be painless. If you work in vertebrates, you're right. Yeah, in vertebrates you don't have to. But in vertebrates is... For the muscles, it is invasive. It is invasive. You have to do it really well. You have to do it really well. Otherwise, of course, you know, for those of you who are sensitive about this, the priority in these things is that the animals don't suffer. If you're doing some surgery and you know that the animal is having a hard time, then you have to sacrifice it. It's better to stop the experiment than to continue and subject it to, to pain. So whenever you are doing this, you have to do a lot of training before. And the measure of success is really that, I mean, you don't want to have a surgery and that the body is in distress because it won't sink. Uh, so basically, you have to do it right. And it takes a lot, it takes some time. But uh, so, you, so it's very difficult to work in the lab and it's very difficult to work with animals in the wild. You have to really go through some very strict committees and, and of course the closer you get to the human, the toughest it is to, to, to get the permit, as it should. And, um, so for example, for monkeys I wouldn't go. I think that even you would have a, a, a bad reaction from people at the university, in our case, for example. Um, in our case we have all the members who are trained, and also we have a veterinarian who is trained in the problem of uh, pain management and, and, and all that. 
addressing ethic committee in the university uh, composed by uh, people from the general public, people from biology, um, veterinarians, uh, you have um, a statistician, uh, and, and all that is a committee that decides whether your protocol is approved or not. Um, and everything new that you want to try, you have to go through a very painful procedure until it's approved. So for me now, changing uh, very much of species, I don't know if I would uh, at this time, but, uh, but for example, for monkeys, probably you're right. Probably marmosets is a good example to try to extend it to something that is closer to humans. Right. Yeah, I have to visit Siddhartha soon. See. Some other questions? When you were singing the, the song to the sleeping bird, is there a limit for the delay between the, the songs or the syllables? For example, can you repeat the same syllable and find the uh, brain activity? So if you would take a segment, instead of playing the whole song, if you would take one syllable and repeat it, and this, uh, for sure I haven't done it. And, uh, and it's interesting. It's not clear to me what would happen. Right. It's, it's a very nice idea. I haven't tried it. I don't know if it's a question of that uh, or whether it's a question of something fundamentally wrong at the level of the modeling uh, for that particular syllable. Maybe you can uh, teach the bird with the That's another very interesting experiment, actually. You, if you train it not with a natural song, Okay, let me show you this. That, that's a very nice experiment. But let me show you this. Um, because we did something similar, but what you're suggesting is better, I think. Um, as you can see, all my presentations are very similar. That will happen to you in your life. So, here what we did is, is the following. We have these canaries, and we trained them with synthetic songs. This was something that we did many, many years ago with the first students we were working, and the idea was whether the model was making any sense to the animals or not. And we said, well, maybe what we can do, at that moment we wouldn't dare to put anything in a bird. We only had a, a recorder and a, a computer, and that was all we had. So we said, well, what can we say if the song is good or not, we'll play it to a little young bird and see if it's copying it. So we did this very simple model, and each syllable was reasonably good, but this is supposed to be for a canary. But instead of being like in a canary, the repetition of a syllable, the repetition of another syllable, and so on, we would smoothly change the phase difference between the motor gestures, so it would be artificial, and we want to know whether the bird will accept that as a tutor or not. So we're playing this weird song. OK, this is really, this is an experiment that you can do with your grandmother's canary and your computer, OK? This is really garage physics. Got published in science, though, eh? but it's garage physics. So this is the song. Oops. See, see, each syllable is okay, but you know the whole syllable thing is kind of weird. So we said, well, and if you put it to the little birds, will it try to do it? So we took 20 of these little birds, and they were trying so hard <laughs> for a whole year. So here's one guy, after one year of practicing with that tutor, okay?
So it lighted. This is another guy. Okay. But in the spring, in two weeks, I'm not kidding, they were practicing this for the whole year. In two weeks, and without listening to a single normal canary, it started to do this. This is exactly the normal song of a canary. So it's the repetition of the seal. So it took all what it had been learning for a whole year, but in the spring, something was turned on. And he said, with this, I'm going nowhere. OK. <laughs> Something showed up, and, and a genetic program took over, and whatever he was learning, he was putting it together right and started to sing properly. So there is a, a very interesting competition in between what you're learning and what you have programmed in there. But the idea is that you can program this verse with synthetic songs and you know, use that as a tutor and, uh, and control some acoustic features, and to some degree, it will be effective. It will be effective. A very interesting thing will, will be when we find what is really sexy for these birds, uh, try to put songs that have the sexy syllables and the non-sexy syllables and see whether they realize that there are some syllables that are going to be more effective than others. Um, this is something that Gonzalo Uribarri is working on, in trying to find what is sexy or not in these songs. But training with uh, sexy and non-sexy syllables is a, is a nice idea. Uh, it's a bit of a weird question, but can you somehow induce some, can you use, induce some synthetic spring with hormones or something? I mean, if you ask a biologist and ask him what are the minimum ingredients for what happens in spring and uh, reproduction, so can you induce some synthetic spring? You, you can. Chemically or something? You like can. That. So I'm, you, if you ask me good questions and then I forgot who or where I took them from, it's, it's not my fault. So some of these, maybe I can steal them. Uh, you, you can induce that by putting testosterone. So you have, we have pell pellets of t testosterone, and you can, or you can put some cream of testosterone in these birds, and they will start to behave closer to how they behave in the spring. Moreover, you can put t testosterone to the females, and they will start to sing. Uh, so you can induce spring chemically with testosterone, and it would be very interesting to see behavior in, in, in the learning of these sexy syllables or not. So testosterone is a kind of spring in a pill. Huh? It's a spring in a pill. Spring in a pill, exactly. Any other question? OK. Before we leave the, ro the room, there is a, there are two groups that still hasn't haven't right there. Please, you are one. Yes. Initially, you were a, a group of four, and then there are a group of two. That's okay. Okay. Well, sorry. <laughs> and the other group, Amanda Cebedo and the. Uh... That's perfect. And remember, I don't know if you were already told, but there is going to be a dinner on Thursday, invited by the school. Did you receive the mail? OK, great. So we were wondering, in order to have more time to relax before going, whether the, this group w would volunteer to be moved here <laughs> so we can leave earlier on Thursday. Who, who are these people? What do you think? So it's
subscribe it just to. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. We're we're going to find a brave volunteer group to. So. Yes. Uh, yeah. See. Sí. Perfect. Okay, so we don't have to move the last one then, right? No, this one. Ah, no, because it's about para allá. No, y esta chica iría para allá. Yeah. There is another group. Amanda Cebedo, you here? Y entonces este? Le preguntamos. Bruno, what do you think? Can we move? Ah, they didn't come. Okay. Okay. We'll so far. So far. <laughs>